mailbag episode taking your voice and turning it into content on today's episode of locked on longhorns you are locked on longhorns your daily podcast on the texas longhorns part of the locked on podcast network your team every day Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, once again, first segment, second segment, third segment, taking your voice, your comments about Locked on Longhorns or other shows I've appeared on, responding to them live and direct on today's show, turning your voice into content. All of that and more on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns part. The Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Some quick housekeeping notes. So this episode will come out on Friday morning, right? But I am recording it on a Thursday. But it'll come out normal time, 11 a.m. Central on YouTube. Um, And then sometime before that on audio. I haven't decided when I'm going to put it out. But I will be in Vegas, right? I'm leaving for Vegas Friday morning. So by the time you hear this and see this, I'll already be in Vegas. And then I don't come back until Monday night. Um, I am a groomsman in a wedding in Vegas on Monday, which should be pretty cool. But anyways, I said that to say that next week's schedule, this week was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I try to stay with that when I'm doing three episodes a week. Next week, my first episode will be on Tuesday. It will not be on Monday because like I said, I will not be back from Vegas until Monday night, really like Tuesday morning because I come back at 1230 a.m. So just letting you know, right? No episode on Monday, but still should have three episodes next week. And the first one should be on Tuesday next week, unless something crazy happens in Vegas. Right? <laughs> pray for me. So uh, today's episode, I've done some episodes over the last couple of weeks. One um, with uh, the Kansas City Chiefs host or Locked On, Locked On Chiefs. I did an episode with Drake, Locked On Big 12, about Texas dominating the SEC, why Oklahoma will not dominate the SEC and why the Big 12 will falter without Texas and Oklahoma. Certainly, a you know, episode uh, Drake was using to get some clicks. And then just some other episodes I've done, right, where I've gotten some comments. Most of the comments I'm reading and reacting to today are negative, which should make for, you know, a better episode. Uh, a lot of people were pissed off at me and Drake over the last couple of weeks, especially Oklahoma Sooner fans. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, that's really it. Mailbag episode, like I said, over the next three segments, I'll be responding to all this hate about me. Um, and then I'll be back on Tuesday. <laughs> all right. So the first comment i guess i'm responding to this was i can't remember and i got these from like multiple channels so i can't remember if this was on drake's channel or it was my channel but it was about the oklahoma segment we did where essentially i said you know you just look at oklahoma's roster and they don't look scary next year i pin i pinned them as an eight and four team drake pinned them as a six and six team you know maybe we were trolling a little bit you know maybe the whole purpose of the episode was to piss off oklahoma fans and i just went with it you know whatever but you know I mean, if you listen to Locked On Longhorns, you know I pretty much never talk about Oklahoma on here. Like, that's just not my angle, right, to try to piss off Oklahoma fans, get them all in my comments, and use them for engagement, all right? Like, that's not how I approach the game, right? That's not how I approach the analysis of sports. So, you know what I mean? Like, I don't talk about Oklahoma a whole bunch, right? And now I'm definitely incentivized not to talk about Oklahoma because, as I can see, like, I do a little six-minute segment about them and why I don't think they'll be elite next year, right? And it leads to over 100 comments telling me I don't know football. But anyways, I just had to set that up. So this is if this is your true opinion, then y'all might as well pick a different career because clearly you are clueless of that reality. Nobody is regretting leaving. That's something that Drake put as the title. Oklahoma regrets leaving the Big 12. Once again, Drake does a good job of invoking emotion. And he had all these Oklahoma phones emotional, right? I clearly don't think that Oklahoma regrets leaving the Big 12. In fact, I think Oklahoma is ecstatic to be moving on to the SEC, even if I think they'll go eight and four in their first year. The Big 12 is trash, and OU ran that conference pretty much since its inception. This ish is silly. Yeah, I mean, they did pretty much run the conference the majority of the time they were in it. But if you look at it, they've what gone now four, five years without a conference championship. In the last two years, they certainly didn't run the conference. So, you know, we're talking about what's happened lately, you know, what we can actually draw off of moving forward. And Oklahoma doesn't have a ton of that. But, yeah, I respect your comment, and I'll certainly look for another career if this one doesn't work out. Uh, the next one is you guys are Texas homers. Who has the better defense coming back? Uh, I guess he's saying Oklahoma. Jackson Arnold is going to be an upgrade from Gabriel. That's crazy to say when the next start that Jackson Arnold makes will be his second one. And Dylan Gabriel has four or five years of experience in college football. Like regardless of what you think of the upside to say that Jackson Arnold, I guess you can say will be better. But how long will that take? 
<laughs> like how long will it take this version of Jackson Arnold to catch up to this current version of Dylan Gabriel, right? Because I'm talking about one game of experience to five years of experience. It's a big gap. And the offensive line, I think, is going to be better than last year's line. Without Tyler Guyton and the offensive lineman that they lost to Missouri, he thinks la this year's offensive line will be better than last year's offensive line. With our receivers coming back and the kid from Indiana coming in, I can guarantee you a nine-win season minimum for Oklahoma, and I wouldn't doubt they have a 10 or 11 win season. OU has a better roster all the way around than Texas does, even if you feel like Oklahoma is going to be really good defensively next season, right? Because I do think Oklahoma has solid defensive pieces. To fix your lips to say that Oklahoma has a better all around roster than the University of Texas right now, even if you think the defense is better, is crazy. Now, maybe what Every Oklahoma fan has accused me and Drake of is not knowing the Oklahoma roster, which I said in the episode, like I don't spend a bunch of time on Sooners Wire. Right. So I don't know what they have coming in. I'm not keeping tabs on every commitment they get. So I, I yes, I am ignorant. to Oklahoma's roster. Right. Maybe. Right. So maybe I shouldn't have did the episode, period. But what I do know is Oklahoma doesn't have a better roster than Texas. <laughs> I know that for a fact. And that's where your ignorance comes in. Next comment. You guys are bozos. Thanks. And should stop talking football. I get paid to do it for a reason. Successful show on YouTube for the last two years. OU has better skill positions than Texas at every position. That's just categorically false, right? When the only players, I won't even say the only players, but the fact that me and Drake, regardless of what level we co cover football on or not, right, can't tell you any of Oklahoma's skill position players. And the fact that all of these Oklahoma fans had to rush to the comments to tell us who we should watch out for this year probably tells you that you don't have better players than Texas at this point. They may perform better this year and, you know, end up on our radar. But going into the season, I don't think there's anybody outside of the state of Oklahoma that thinks that Oklahoma has a better roster than Texas, but specifically better skill positions on offense than Texas. That's ridiculous. Stay off the Internet, man. OU has beaten Texas six of seven and 18 of 25. Right. And what does that mean in 2024? That's what nobody can tell me. All of these people that are so convinced that Texas will be bad because they've been bad before. What does Oklahoma beating Texas 18 out of 25 times mean for the 2024 game? Do they get extra points when Red River starts in 2024? <laughs> you know, do they get more seats than Texas when the game starts in 2024? What does what Texas did over the last decade have anything to do with 2024? And what does Oklahoma being better than Texas the last 24 years have to do with anything that's happening in 2024 or moving forward. We have the deepest defense in the SEC. Maybe. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't think that's the case. I think Georgia could definitely say they have the deepest defense in the SEC. But sure, Oklahoma may be up there, right? Offense is never a question. Offense is never a question with the quarterback that will be making his second start the next time he takes the field. Texas slept on us last year and see what happened. We're going to beat Mississippi and Mizzou by two touchdowns. Talk about overrated. Yes, Texas slept on you last year and then watched you lose to Kansas, Oklahoma State, and Arizona in your next six games. I don't want to hear any more Texas fans use that weak, rent-free excuse after watching a Texas commentator come back to the Big 12 just to talk trash on OU. If you haven't noticed, if you look at the dates – it's not July 1st yet, so Texas and Oklahoma are still part of the Big 12. And if my Big 12 host reaches out and says he needs content, you know what I mean? I'm my brother's keeper. You know what I mean? So Locked On Podcast Network, we're all helping each other, right? And if Drake wants to use me to piss off Oklahoma fans and get his views up, and if Drake needs me for content, I need Drake for content the same way, then we're going to hop on and talk about pressing topics. And that day, the pressing topic to Drake was – Will Oklahoma succeed in the SEC? He does not think so. I think they will eventually, but just not this year. I think they'll go eight and four, right? But, um, yeah, you can call me rent-free, I guess. I did go on a podcast to talk about Oklahoma somewhat unprovoked. So, in that sense, I am rent-free, I guess. But, I mean, I'm on Twitter every day. <laughs> I don't think any fan base can call any fan base rent-free. And we're definitely not rent-free right now because Texas is playing Oklahoma in softball, right? So, <laughs> we have no reason to be rent-free. Old Drake. This is about Drake, right? But, I mean, I was in the episode. <laughs> Old Drake has the engagement farming thing down to a science, it would appear. Gets a Texas creator, me, to tell everyone how unprepared Oklahoma, them, is for the SEC. When OU beat Texas last season, 
and has the most production returning on defense of any team in the SEC. The depleted roster, in air quotes, Jonathan talked about, has one of the top-ranked wide receiver rooms in the country. By who? One of the top-ranked running back rooms in the country. By who? One of the top-ranked secondaries with a third award watch list, Billy Bowman and five-star. I'm pretty sure Oklahoma fans just had to or I'm pretty sure a, a on three analysts just had to respond to Oklahoma fans because the Oklahoma safety room was not on their top 10 list. And they were in his mention so bad that he had to come out and respond to them directly about why Oklahoma was not on their top 10 list, but instead was in the best of the rest and why Billy Bowman, who they keep championing was very average last year in terms of PFF grade, even though he had some big interceptions, right? I think maybe, you know, obviously interceptions mean more than a PFF grade, but the fact that the on three analysts had to come out and respond to Oklahoma fans directly means that you all, and I guess this is the theme, think your roster is way better than people who aren't biased to the University of Oklahoma. Keep going. Second year safety, Peyton Bowen, not to mention a Buckkiss Award watch list linebacker in Danny Stutzman. Even a complete SEC homer said just yesterday that the Sooners will likely have a top three defense in the SEC in 2024. The offensive line questions are fair to ask, but OU filled very well in the portal and have the best O-line coach in America. So this shot you took, particularly using a Texas guy to take it with, just makes you look very ill-informed and quite petty Drake. The fact that you can call somebody very ill-informed when just the sentence before this, you said Oklahoma has the best offensive line coach in the country, yet your offensive line coach is not named Kyle Flood, means you, sir, are the one that's ill-informed. A quick word from our sponsors, and then we get into more hate about me, Drake, and I guess everybody else that's ever been all locked on Longhorns. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guarantee Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed. Fit only available to U.S. customers. All right. Yo, 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 yo. We're back. Everyone is a Texas hater. If you understand football, there's a reason Vegas has them at 10 and a half wins. Thank you. Right. Obviously, I don't want to say obviously, but Vegas would never, ever, at least that I've seen, put somebody's win total at 11 and a half. Right. Because it's only based on the regular season. So if you're putting somebody's win total at 11 and a half, that means the over thinks you're, you believe they're going undefeated. Right. I don't think Vegas would ever give a college football team no margin for error in that regard. So even the best teams, the championship level teams, right? Their line always probably the highest it's going to be is 10 and a half, right? To force you to take them at 11 or take them lower than that, right? Vegas, right? All those nice fancy buildings that I'll see in the morning, right? Like in Vegas are there for a reason, right? Because we all think we know more than Vegas. And the reason Vegas looks like it does is because none of us know more than Vegas, right? Vegas has Texas's win total set at 10 and a half wins because they believe they are a legitimate national championship contender. We Texas fans are somehow wrong for thinking that the team that was one play away from the national championship game last year will be really good again this season and maybe could even get back to that point to where they're competing for a national championship. But because Texas struggled from 2010 to 2021, I'm supposed to be like, well, nah, we can't win in 2024 because of what happened in 2015. Give me a break. Vegas knows more than all of us, right? And Vegas thinks Texas is going to be a really good football team. This was regarding my comments about the Big 12 moving on after Texas and Oklahoma and how I think they'll be fine in terms of they'll be able to make, you know, the college football playoffs and people will watch Big 12 football, right? It's a lot of, you know, very passionate, really good fan bases in the Big 12. But the question I had about is how do you sell the Big 12 to the casual fan? Before you had Red River every year that you could sell to the casual fan, right? Even before that, going back, right? You had Texas and Texas A&M that you could sell every year to the casual fan. And then Texas and Oklahoma were national championship contenders. Other teams sprinkled in there. And then so you had big marquee games, right? 
what are the big marquee games in the Big 12 once Texas and Oklahoma leaves, right? You're already losing Red River, which is the biggest game in the conference every season. Of course, Colorado is coming, and so people are going to want to watch Colorado, and so you're going to have that meal ticket, but how long is that going to last when Shadir and Travis Hunter have one more year in college? And I would assume that Deion is not going to be at Colorado three seasons from now, right? So once you lose that meal ticket, What's going to draw casual fans to the Big 12? Because that's what moves the needle, right? Casual fans, right? Obviously, you're going to have passionate fan bases every week watching Iowa State, Baylor, TCU, Kansas State, et cetera, et cetera. But on a national level, who wants to watch those teams? Or what reason do they have to watch those teams, right? If you look at the best games the Big 12 has to offer, Kansas State, Iowa State, Baylor, TCU, whoever Colorado plays, Utah, BYU, like, let's just be honest. None of those games are moving the needle outside of those respective fan bases, right? And even if you said this game has championship implications, right? Let's say Kansas State and Iowa State are ranked sixth and seventh in the country, respectively. Do you still think the majority of the country is going to, I want to say majority of the country because the majority of the country doesn't tune into anything, right? But do you still think Thousands or millions of casual fans will tune into Kansas State, Iowa State, even if they were both top 10 teams, even if it came down to deciding potentially a playoff spot. No. So the problem with the Big 12 moving forward is not that they don't have Texas and Oklahoma from a football sense. I think they'll be fine. Right. Because it's set up for them to be able to accomplish everything they want to in terms of football. But in terms of money, you know, revenue, appeal, eyes on you, viewership, how can the Big 12 generate that? without Texas, Oklahoma, and in the near future, Colorado, right? I'm not saying they can't. I just don't see a path to it. And I think that's the biggest question for the Big 12 moving forward. Y'all have been in the Big 12 far too long. Dominate. This is when I said Texas would dominate. I was just using the word that, you know, Drake wanted to use. I came back and contextualized it a little bit, said that for Texas to be dominant, they would have to be 20 and four over their first three seasons in the SEC, just SEC games and win one conference championship because Georgia only has one conference championship in the last three years, even though they have two championships, national championships in that span. Um, so that's why I use the word dominate. But, you know, I got on, you know, the podcast and said it. So, you know, I got to deal with it. Come on. Texas will lose once or twice this season to teams. They're expected to beat who like put a name on it. Who? Right. Don't just say, I think they're going to lose to somebody. Who do you think Texas is going to lose to? I'm getting tired of people. I don't want to say I'm getting tired because I'm not that passionate about it. But the problem is, is like there's no real football analysis with these comments. It's all just I feel, I think, I feel, I think, I feel, I think, I feel, I think. Right. Because of something, like I said, that happened in 2015. Like we all can see this is not the same Texas. So put a name on it. What teams that Texas has no business losing to in 2024 will they lose to in 2024? Please tell me. SEC schedule is a grind that beats teams up physically and the schedule takes a toll on teams throughout the season. Every week in the SEC, the other team can beat you if you aren't at your best. That's not the case in the top heavy Big 12 where you have to show up two to three times per season to win the conference. I'll give you that, especially this past season. In the SEC, you have to show up physically and mentally every single week ready to play. Even the bad teams, excluding Arkansas and Vanderbilt, two teams that are on Texas schedule, you're telling on yourself, to have athletes that can beat you. Even Auburn, which was four and five in the SEC West last season, is ranked top 30 this year preseason. The same Auburn team that lost to New Mexico State and gave up a 31 yard pass to Jalen Milro <laughs> with no time left on the clock. Right. <laughs> a 31 yard touchdown pass to Jalen Milro in the back of the end zone with no time on the clock. This team also lost to New Mexico State just last season. But because now they're top 30 in the preseason and are not on Texas schedule for two years. I'm supposed to be worried about Auburn. That's the example you wanted to give. Give me a break. Just shows the level of athleticism. Texas is certainly a good program. Don't misunderstand me. However, nobody in the SEC is scared and they can't wait to play an overconfident Longhorn team. Sark has his work cut out for him as the Longhorn team fans and apparently the media such as yourselves are about to have a rude awakening. Welcome to the SEC. Thanks. And we're about to kick y'all ass when we get there. Just looked at their schedule. Texas has the easiest SEC schedule for not matter of fact. I'm going back to that one. Sorry, I'm going back to that one. I can't just dismiss that like that because all you heard was those same SEC narratives you've been hearing for the last 15 years. The SEC is a grind. It's the tough teams. It's not just the top teams. It's having to go through the grind week in and week out. Even the tough teams like Arkansas and I mean, even the weak teams like Arkansas and Vanderbilt, which are 25% of Texas's SEC schedule, right? Like, 
at some point, y'all have to update your resume or update your analysis, right? You can't just keep spewing the same stuff about the SEC that you've been saying for the last 15 years, because if you look up, if you use your eyes, it's not true anymore, right? It's just not true. Yes, Texas may be in a grind this season that they're not accustomed to. Yes, Texas may lose a game that they have no business losing, right? That could happen because there's talented football players all over the country, right? But to say that just because it's the Texas will struggle just because it's the SEC, to say that we're overconfident just because it's the SEC, that's all the analysis you have for me, that because it's the SEC, that Texas won't be as good, right? Because instead of having to play, you know, just Georgia and Oklahoma, now they got to play Georgia, Oklahoma, Kentucky, and in Florida right after. <laughs> Come on now. Just looked at their schedule. Texas has the easiest SEC schedule for a contender I can ever remember. Wow. Missing the top half of the league except Georgia. Avoiding the entire SEC West except for Arkansas and AM is quite something. It can barely be considered an SEC schedule, really. I mean, it can't barely be considered an SEC schedule because there's eight SEC teams on it, right? And once again, I just keep saying this, keep, you know, beating this into y'all's heads. The only difference is if this is not the same SEC y'all are accustomed to, but y'all keep giving it the same credit and reference <laughs> that y'all gave the previous SEC. It is not the same SEC. And now Texas steps in from day one as one of the top dogs in the conference, period, point blank. A quick word from our sponsors. And I get back into the rest of these hate comments and people telling me I don't know football even though I've forgotten more football than they'll ever know. All right, getting back to these uh, YouTube comments. Texas hasn't dominated anyone since Vince Young won the national championship for them. I've watched this team underachieve for years and be overhyped each and every year. Okay, and what does that have to do with 2024? Crickets. Let's break down the 2023 season, their one and only good season they've had in over a decade. I would think uh, New Year's Six win, you know, New Year's Six Bowls win and, and 10 win season is pretty good in 2018. But I get it. That's not the standard for Texas. We know that. Y'all know that. So I understand that. A nice win in Tuscaloosa. You already know what word is next. But <laughs> let's be honest. It was not a good Bama team early on. They go to South Florida the next week and barely got out with the W. That team ended up with one loss in the regular season, two losses overall to the national champion, and won, the co I mean, won their conference, the SEC. The only two teams they lost to both made the Final Four in college football this year in Michigan and Texas. So I know he said early on, right? I know he did preface his statement with early on. But you know what you're trying to say, right? Texas got their win against Bama, but it's not the same Bama team. But the Bama team that beat Texas in 2022, let me guess, that was the same Bama team. Give me a break. Then they play an Oklahoma team who were double-digit underdogs and OU spanked their ass. Okay. Oklahoma came into that game undefeated. Texas came into that game undefeated. It was a neutral site game, right? This is the problem with people thinking they can just say anything on the internet. And because most people are too lazy to fact check it, it becomes true. I'm not that person that's too lazy because as soon as I read this comment, I knew it was BS, but I love Google. It's my favorite website. Oklahoma, when that game closed, was a four and a half point underdog. Last time I checked, four and a half is not double digit. But common sense will tell you an undefeated opponent in a neutral site game probably would never, ever, six games into the season undefeated, would probably never be a double digit underdog. But in this case, right, because there are scenarios where there could be, this was not the case. Oklahoma, this man said they were double-digit underdogs. They finished, right, before the game started, at tip or at kickoff, they were a four-and-a-half-point underdog. And OU spanked their ass. Yes, OU won by four points, right, on a last-second touchdown. I'm not even trying to, like, qualify their win or, like, water it down or anything like that. But you said they were double-digit favorites. Oklahoma was, in fact, a four-and-a-half-point underdog. So you were wrong there. And then you said, oh, you spanked their ass, which is subjective, right? So I can't tell you you're wrong there, but they won by four points at the very end of the game. In fact, Texas had a lead with less than two minutes left. So I don't know how in any scenario in football, you can say you got spanked in that regard, but David knows more than me, clearly. The only really good team they played was Washington. Texas was obviously out coached in the playoffs and against OU. Texas won four conference championships. Oklahoma won 13. Texas had one good season. I'll wait so they can manage to string together three or four before I call them dominant. That's a fair point for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like when I contextualize what dominance would look like, I said that, you know, 
I would only be able to tell that after three years after they've played every team in the SEC. So we're that we're on the same page in that regard. But like I said, when you just get on the Internet and just start saying things that you don't even know are true, then I can't take the rest of your comments seriously. Once again, double digit underdogs. They were four and a half point underdogs. Whooped Texas. They won by four points. Jonathan, can you do a video comparing the 2024 team to the 2005 and 2009 teams? Love this comment. Three people like this, so they love this comment as well. What I will say to that is I don't think I'm the best person for the job, but I did refer out. Right? You know, I did outsource. Right. When I saw this comment, I reached out to Nino from Nino's Corner, Corner Sports. Um, I just think he's a great historian. He's older than me. He was at Texas as a student and an RA to the football team during the 05 championship. So I think he would definitely be, um, you know, probably better equipped to me to compare this current team to the 2005 team when he has great relationships with a lot of players on that team. And then when you look at 2009, I think he'd be able to do the same thing. And then Nash, I reached out to because I think Nash is just, you know, so good in terms of the numbers and the history of the program and being able to contextualize things now and, you know, how they compare to things in the past. And so, you know, I would love to help them with the episode. I would love to come on and, you know, talk, you know, definitely lend my voice. But, you know, I think that in terms of them being historians of the University of Texas, I think that that would be an episode that they could do better comparing the 2024 team to 2005 and 2009. All these locked on DEI hires suck. <laughs> All these locked on DEI hires suck. Man. <laughs> Whew. Look, I'm a Sooner through and through, but I don't understand the Texas love. Dominate the SEC. We're already putting Texas in the Bama and Georgia category, just thinking they're going to reload after losing all that talent to the NFL draft. We lost 11 players to the NFL, but as I did on an episode earlier this week, Texas very well could have 11 players drafted again this season. We don't rebuild, we reload. I'm glad we could finally say that, right? We don't put a wait and see on a Texas team that has struggled for a decade, but put a wait and see on a team who has dominated their conference for a decade plus, had one bad season after coaching turnover, and it's over for OU coming off a 10-win season. Man, y'all some clowns. Once again, I will say everything you said really has nothing to do with 2024, right? What Oklahoma has done over the last decade, what Texas did over the last decade really has no bearing on 2024. And then when you look at this past season, right? Yes, Oklahoma won 10 games, but they were four and three in their last seven. So four and three over your last seven. What makes me think that you're going to come into this season and dominate with a harder schedule, right? Whereas when you look at Texas after they lost to Oklahoma, they did not lose again until they got to the college football playoffs and dominated a few of those teams they saw on the way while Oklahoma with everything in front of them was going four and three. So excuse me if I don't think Oklahoma coming off of a four and three stretch just has a ton of momentum coming into the 2024 season where their schedule is exponentially harder than it was last year. My favorite Texas podcast for the past few years. Shocked to hear that you have a nine to five as well. You have the perfect balance of information and entertainment like Drake, too. But it's obvious he sensationalizes everything to get a rise. He even tried to bait you at the start by saying he was only talking about football, despite his agenda on the screen saying all sports. Keep doing your thing. The ones who are here for insight appreciate you for sure. Uh, yes, I do have a nine to five. You know what I'm saying? And it's a it's a grind. But um, I signed up for the grind for sure. You know what I'm saying? Um, what I will say is, you know, what I was saying, not necessarily as a shot at Drake. I think that, you know, we live in a society, a capitalist society, right, where money kind of controls all decisions. Right. And I think that, you know, what you see the media do on TV or what you see the media do on Twitter or certain podcasts is based on money and metrics. Right. At the end of the day, people feel like they need to do or some people need to do. Right. Excuse me. Let me say this a better way. Success is defined by these metrics that we have available, right? How much money you make from your podcast, how much, how many likes you're getting, how many views you're getting, how many subscriptions you're getting, right? How many comments you're getting. That's how success is defined by most people. I define success as waking up in the morning, putting out a really good podcast episode and being proud of the work that I'm putting out, right? Whether it gets 200 views or 2000 views, I define success the same way every day. So I never get too high or too low, right? But some people define success by the tangible metrics, right? Likes, comments, views, and subscriptions. And if you define sex, success that way, excuse me, then you're going to do whatever you can in your power to get to those metrics. And we have seen for the last decade in sports media, there is a pretty clear formula to achieving those metrics, right? 
even if it's disingenuous sports content, right? And I think, I'm not saying that Drake puts out disingenuous content, but I'm saying Drake clearly goes out of his way to invoke emotion from people, which leads to a lot of really good metrics. So I think Drake is a really good host, and that's why I do content with him, because I respect him, and I think he knows a lot about sports, right? But we just have two different approaches to the game, right? Because I define success by putting out content and feeling good about the content I put out, right? Drake defines success by the tangible metrics we have available. And we both are striving to achieve our different metrics of success. But when your metrics or when your version of success is defined by tangible metrics, like I said, likes, subscriptions, things of that nature, then you have to do what you have to do to get to that point. And Drake does what he has to do to get to that point. Like it, love it, hate it, you're probably going to watch. Drake has found the formula. Great guest. Makes me want to be a Texas fan. This was on the Locked On Chiefs episode. I appreciate that. It's always cool when people can hear you for the first time. You know, not saying that anybody from the Texas fan base takes me for granted or anything, but I've been doing this show for two years, right? You know, eventually your voice becomes a little stagnant to somebody or, you know, you, you kind of just get used to, you know, Jonathan Davis from Locked On Longhorn. So it's cool when people hear me for the first time and, you know, it's cool to, you know, hear what they have to say about it, you know, and we may have a new Texas fan on the 40, right? Wow, Jonathan, great insight and smooth delivery. You have a future in sports media. Thank you for your comments. I really appreciate that. But only thing I'll add is hopefully I have a present in sports media. Like I said, a successful show on YouTube and audio the last two years. Here's to the next two. Hook them. See y'all on Tuesday. Peace.